So, uh, who am I? Uh, hopefully I've met uh, quite a few of you. I am uh, most known as the documentation guy. Um, I am the documentation guy for one very important reason, and that's that most of the core developers don't speak English as a first language. So for those of us in the room, there's an incredible opportunity to speak good English and then get accolades for it. So I invite you to come to the documentation. Um, you'll, you'll skip straight to the top. <coughs> um, there are some parts of the, if, if you like the documentation, um, well, of course, most people that talk to me say, oh, I like the documentation. Um, though I did corner people at a conference once, and it was a PHP conference, and I said, it's like, oh, hey, what do you guys, where are you guys from? Oh, from Philadelphia. Okay, what, you know, what do you guys, what do you guys program in? Symphony. Oh, really? What do you think of the documentation? Horrible. <laughs> I was like, well, I guess I shouldn't have asked. Um, so if you like the documentation, uh, that was, that, I, I probably uh, wrote it or edited it or merged it in. Um, if you didn't like it, um, there's quite a few pieces that Fabian still wrote, so I apologize for his portions. <coughs> yep. He's, um, he's removing my access right now. <laughs> uh, most importantly, I am the husband of Leanna Pelham. And now, if you've been to any of my talks before, this is normally the time where we Twitter bomb her. <coughs> we don't have to do that today because she's sitting in the room. She's right there. Wave. Yay! Yeah, finally, she made it into a conference. So we can't Twitter bomb her, because she, and it wouldn't be a surprise anyways. Um, but I do like to surprise her, and this is the first time I think that she's seen me talk. Um, so one of the things that Leanna loves is high fives. And <laughs> <laughs> nothing would make her day better than just lots of high fives after this. Um, she loves high fives almost as much as Fabian loves hugs. Little known fact. <laughs> Not getting invited back next year. <laughs> yep. So I've been invited here to talk today about uh, the Symphony components. Okay, so as uh, most of you probably know, Symphony is a component library. It consists of 23-ish, 23 depending on when you count and what's being merged in, 23 individual components that make up the Symphony library. And this is what allows us to you know, be brought into things like Drupal. Um, each of those is available on Composer. And this is not really very interesting for most of us. Uh, the fact that our framework, most of us are using um, uh, the Symphony framework, even the easy published guys are bringing in the whole framework. It, who cares that they're made of components? I know that's a good thing overall for like, the greater community. That's nice. Um, but I use all the features anyway, so why do I care about the components? So that's kind of um, my uphill battle to climb with you all, is to make you care about these components and hopefully to, uh, to make you guys excited about the components. Um, so there's a couple of reasons that the co components are particularly important. Uh, first, we suck at sharing in PHP, and we know this. My God, we have like Cake PHP and Drupal and WordPress, and I've used no code from any of those, right? Because we're all the, these own separate things. Um, and so, bringing in historically bringing in external libraries is just a depressing thing to do. I don't want to bring in Zen Framework into my project because it's hard to do. Uh, we have a couple of things to worry about with this. Yeah, I'm wandering too far. Um, one, how the heck do I auto load their files? So who here has brought, uh, for example, Zen Framework component into Symphony 1? Yeah? Is that a good time? <laughs> Maybe? Depends. Depends. Like, I had, I had code to copy and paste, so it was okay. Um, so autoloading is a problem. You know, Symphony autoloads the Symphony classes, but it doesn't autoload the Zen Framework classes. I don't even know how Symphony's autoloader works in Symphony 1, so it's like, I don't know what's going on. I just get a class not found error. Um, does their library depend on anything else? Uh, Zen Framework is a perfect thing. It's like, well, I want Zen Lucene. Well, Zen Lucene actually depends on you know, a couple other components. So you need to know that you need those components. Uh, and heck, what if I found like a cake PHP plugin? Well, then I'm totally screwed. That, you know, that depends on something that's way too big. Uh, and last, how do I store these into my project? SVN externals, get submodules, uh, just commit the whole damn thing into my project, even though it's external code. These are the problems that we've sort of faced uh, in, in, a, in, in a large reason um, for why PHP is sort of in the state that it was and, and where we're going uh, from there. Um, so this is the example I brought up earlier, putting Zen Framework into Symphony 1. This is from the Jobby tutorial. This is official Symphony 1.4 documentation, and it's insane. I wouldn't have thought that now, but we've come so far that I look at this now, and I was like, what the frick were we thinking? This is totally crazy. So step one, manually download from the Zen Framework website. Get the whole darn framework. Manually download it. Probably that means I just committed it into my repository. I don't know. Maybe I did a submodule or, or, sub or, or an external. Um, second, love this. Uh, go ahead and delete everything you don't need. 
Um, but be careful because you need some of it that you don't realize that you need. And this is not a knock, by the way, against Zen Framework. I use Zen Framework 1 because it actually was a component library, so it's a good example for, for doing this. This is going to be true with anything. There are dependencies. So it's like, yeah, delete everything. Oh, no, you needed that. And then, oh, class not found. You're like, crap, put it back. Um, so how am I supposed to know I need that? And oh, my God, the auto-loading at the end of it. Are you kidding me? Uh, what is this? Uh, set include path. Get include path. Get this other auto loader I've never heard of. I just want to use the, the in this case the Zen Lucene library. So these are the problems, and components obviously, and also composer. Um, you know, no, no spoiler. We're going to talk about composer a little bit. Um, these are the keys to making this easier. Um, the second reason you guys should care is components are the key to understanding your framework. I don't care what that is. If you're going to be a Drupal 8 developer, if you're going to be an easy published developer, uh, the components are the things that are under the hood. So we need to understand those. Uh, and third. Uh, if PHP is big, we're all going to kick ass. If PHP is small, we're all not going to kick ass. So what I mean by that is, is PHP is huge, right? We're huge. Like we, we own everything. We should, be, we should be walking down the street with the strut because like we basically own the web. Okay? For example, PHP versus Ruby on Google Trends. This is uh, the past year. So I mean, if you looked like five years ago, it'd be even more ridiculous. We kicked their ass, right? So, right, so we have all the better tools than Ruby guys, right? We're years ahead of them, right? Not right? <laughs> I'm a little confused then. <laughs> so, uh, what's, what's going on? We're not lazy. I work all the time. I can't see anymore. I work so much. Um, so, the problem is fragmentation. Uh, we think of PHP as huge. Wrong. PHP is not huge, not the way we treat PHP, because we subdivide into little clans. Those little clans have no communication uh, or crossover whatsoever. So put that same thing up. This is Ruby on Rails versus different PHP frameworks. And notice, actually, the blue and the red are basically Ruby on Rails. I mean, ROR might be bringing up some other results. There's always some noise in here. Um, but they kick our ass. And no surprise that Ruby on Rails slash Ruby, because if you do Ruby, you probably do Ruby on Rails for web stuff. Their tools are way better than ours. They've had Gem for years. They have Bundler. They have all these things that make it a much smoother process. They've always kind of been ahead of us, and we've just been reacting to it. Or, or worse, not reacting to it, just kind of not doing anything. So this is our uphill battle here, is that we are actually the underdogs. We are not the big power in the house. We should not be walking around with the strut. Um, Ruby people don't look us in the eye. You know, we don't want this. <clears throat> we don't look them in the eye either. No, I'm just kidding. <clears throat> Um, so the most important thing that happens here uh, is that the, on the library level, we get scattered. So I'm looking for, in this case, I'm, I'm looking for, hey, I want like some, sort of, some sort of library to help me do some authorized.net uh, integration of some sort. And what do I get? I get three Cake PHP plugins and a CodeIgniter plugin. At which point, I just throw my computer across. I'm like, damn it, I can't do anything with this code. Those may, I don't know, I'm not even going to open them and bother. Those may have wonderful code in them, dressed in some plugin stuff, but I can't get at it. I can't use it. It's kind of back to the drawing board. So I have to find my, my little world's version of the authorized.net library, if it exists, my Symphony plugin, my Symphony 2 bundle, whatever. So it's other problems, too. We have, we have to know more information, because all of a sudden, uh, I have to work on a coding igniter project for some reason. It's difficult to hire. Everyone's like, hey, where are the Symphony developers? I'm like, I don't know, but I like, know a ton of PHP developers. Um, we disjoin ourselves in the forums and Stack Overflow because it's no longer PHP. It's like, well, no, 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 I'm not programming in PHP. I'm programming in CodeIgniter. I mean, that's ridiculous. Um, and finally, like, interoperability is just not a word that we've ever had in our vocabulary. And that's the problem I said before. I was like, well, I see a cake PHP plugin. That's that, I mean, it might as well be a Java plugin. It's not going to help me at all, which is sort of absurd. <clears throat> so components are the answer because these are the actual shareable pieces. If we did make components, um, component kind of, by my definition, would be something that's not attached to a framework, just works across all PHP, <clears throat> then bang, we have something that we can actually share. So those are kind of the, uh, the status of things right now. Uh, the first thing we need to do is we need to make sharing sexy again. Um, sharing is hard. Bringing the Zen Framework, th Zen Framework 1 library into Sy Symphony 1 was really, really hard. So let's make that simpler. <clears throat> and fortunately, this is something that's already been taken care of, and, and it sort of needed to be taken care of at like a PHP-wide type of thing. <clears throat> so how many people have heard of uh, this group, the interoperability group? That's not bad. That was like a third or so. <clears throat> so simply put, this is the United Nations of PHP. <clears throat> yeah? And... 
almost in every way you can think of, especially if you focus on the United Nations being cons- consisting of lots of politicians, this is kind of how this group works. Um, but imagine the world without the United Nations, and it's the same thing with here. This group has actually done some really great things for us. The first problem they solved was auto-loading. The code for auto-loading was horrible. I don't want to have to bring in a library and worry about how I'm supposed to auto-load their classes. So the problem with auto-loaders is, like I said earlier, auto-loaders are made to auto-load a certain set of files. And um, how, many people, how many people have ever heard of the function SPL auto-load register? Okay, good. That's actually more than I thought. So real quick, auto-loading something has, happens behind the scenes. As soon as I say new foo in reference to foo class, there's a function called silently in the background. That, jobs, the, that function, which is called an auto-loader, its job is to receive a class name, foo, and its job is to know where foo lives and require that file. And as long as it requires that file, life goes on. So we just say new foo, and you don't realize there's actually a function being called in the background, and it loads up the file. So the key to an autoloader is, though, that with only knowing the class name, it needs to know where that file exists. Where does foo.php exist? I have no idea. So the issue is every library ends up having its own autoloader, because Symfony goes, well, I know where the Symfony files are. Zen Framework knows where I know where the Zen Framework files are. And everybody ends up with their own autoloader, uh, which, frankly, is absolutely insane. I mean, this really is the best analogy. I mean, we can't get anything done because we're clashing immediately on that layer, and there's just no reason to do it. Autoloading is not sexy. Autoloading is not solving a business problem. Autoloading is a, just a language-level problem that just needs to go away, and we don't need to worry about it, and we don't need to lose time on it. So the group came down from the mountain, and they brought with them one piece of wisdom, and it is that, hey, we should all name our classes in a similar fashion, which doesn't sound like that big of a deal. It's almost like coding standards. But it had very, very big repercussions for the rest of us. <clears throat> Specifically, Symphony 1, there was a class called SF Request. Remember, the autoloader has to just only receives SF Request and has to know where to actually load that, cla- that file from. And of course, it has no idea. Maybe the autoloader is smart enough to know that Symphony in general exists in this uh, Lib vendor Symphony directory, but it doesn't really know where to go from there uh, simply on the class name itself. <clears throat> so, and you guys all um, have probably seen this before, though you may or may not know kind of the reason behind it. Obviously, this is PHP 5.3 namespaces. And the big piece of wisdom was like, hey, what if we changed our backslashes to forward slashes and then added a dot PHP to the end? <clears throat> now, just from the class name, as long as your autoloader knows that Symphony in general is in this vendor uh, Symphony source directory, all it needs to do is like it receives the class name, it literally just sh- switches it and adds .php at the end and just requires the file. This is why in Symphony two and Symphony one we had to like clear the cache for new class files. Or, you know, at times Symphony two, you don't have to do that. Like if you get a class not found in Symphony two, it's because it took your class name and switched the things and added .php, and darn it, that file's not there, or that file's there and you have a typo on your class name. There's no clear in the cache. Like it's as perfectly logical as it could possibly be. So, anyways, this is a big deal because it means that if, as long as you build an autoloader that works with this PSR zero naming convention, then it's going to be able to autoload any uh, any library that follows that. And the really good news is that pretty much everybody is is kind of falling in line uh, with this thing. I mean, everybody meaning. Um, you know, not like excluding the WordPress guys because they're on their own planet, but the vast majority of PHP, yeah. <coughs> Well, well, they're also way bigger than we are, so I guess we can't threaten them. Um, so in this case, the universal class, uh, universal class loader is just a, um, a class inside one of Symphony, Symphony's components. Um, it's PSR0 compliant, and we just tell it where Zen Framework is, and that's it. We can immediately now start referencing Zen Framework classes, assuming we have it in that directory. Uh, and what's funny about this is uh, this universal class loader is an... Uh, uh, we know exactly what it does, right? Because it just, it just flips the things. So I could replace that. Uh, this is Symphony's autoloader here. I could replace it with Zen Framework's autoloader, with Lithium's autoloader. All the autoloaders, they all do the same exact thing now. I mean, it's sort of like the, the pinnacle of sort of ridiculousness in, in uh, repeating code. Because uh, they all do the same thing. And that's actually, uh, even though it's weird to have five libraries that do the same thing, um, the reason behind it's actually great. So I, I mentioned as long as Zen Framework is there... Um, then we're going to autoload it. So this goes back to the other problem. It's like, well, how do I get it there in the first place? And at this point, you guys all know, the big, amazing solution is Composer. And this really, really is amazing. Composer um, changes everything. Well, the PSR0 thing was needed. Composer changes everything. There's, there's three steps. 
Very simple. I'm not going to talk about it too much because most of you guys earlier said, yeah, you use it. And it's, it's really, really simple to use anyways, except for sometimes when you get these big, long errors about this dependency relies on that dependency relies on that dependency. Oh, man, I struck a chord. <laughs> Jordy up here. <laughs> Um, three steps. You create a composer.json file in your project, and you put the library you need and then the version you want. And you look these up on packages.org. That would be the easiest way to do it, which is just a repository for it. Cool. You get this uh, fancy library made by Jordy called Composer, and you run composer.far install, and it downloads the li- that library and any libraries it depends on into the vendor directory, and it's just that simple. And bam, all of a sudden with you know, three lines of code and a composer.json file, I have Zen Framework and whatever Zen Framework needs in my vendor directory. Um, as an added bonus, it's going to take care of the auto-loading for me. And this is something that it doesn't need to do. All it needed to do was download the uh, libraries, and we could have used like Symfony's auto-loader. Um, but since it's downloading Zen Framework, it knows where it put it. And that's the only thing that the auto-loader needs to know as long as Zen Framework is following the... Uh, the naming convention, it just needs to know that somebody downloaded it into the, you know, the vendor slash Zen directory. It knows that, so it creates a little map for the autoloader, and all we have to do is just require the file. So three lines, and two of them were squiggly braces in a composer.json file, one require statement, and I'm using whatever library I want to. And like, this is amazing. And this really does change everything, because the barrier of entry just went huge down to basically nothing. I mean, you cannot beat uh, basically having two lines of code to get this type of things done. Um, so I'm no longer going to resist bringing in external libraries. I'm going to celebrate bringing in external libraries, and I'm going to make my community bigger. So the second thing I want to show you is, um, like I said, sort of know thy components. And I have n- enough time up here to sort of get you guys interested in a few of the, the more fundamental and more interesting components inside Symphony 2. So here's our menu of things. Um, some of these are more interesting than others, um, but they're all very, very good. The first four I want to highlight I would call the framework components. And these are going to be the ones, not exactly the, not the exact set, but basically the ones that Drupal is bringing, for example. These are the ones it would use if you're building a framework. So for most of us, we don't actually care. We're not going to build a framework. But because these are being used in the Symfony framework or in Easy Publish uh, or in Drupal, these are going to be very, very important for us to understand if we really want to leverage our framework. So the first one is HTTP Foundation, uh, which if you guys have done, um, if, if you've done Symfony 2, you've run into this, whether or not you know the name. You probably do from just including the use statements at the top of your class. So first, now installing things is fun. So I'm going to do it as often as possible. Again, if you're using the framework, you don't have to do this. Uh, but I just want to show how easy it is. So we just go look up our library, pose it at fire install, and then we require vendor slash auto load. So you guys can do this right now. Right now, in the flat PHP script, and you'd be up and running with HTTP Foundation. So if you had like really small application, you guys can just start bringing in tools and, and using them, and, and not just Symfony, other tools as well. <clears throat> so um, at the lowest level, we do not share things. Uh, Drupal does not share something, anything with Symfony, does not share anything with Zen Framework. Um, and it's hard because we, like, Drupal is very, very different than Symfony is. Uh, but like anything else, just like with class interfaces, we, if we think about it hard enough, or if Fabian thinks about it hard enough, you can start to boil it down to what the most fundamental pieces are that we can agree on. And the first thing here is the request and response. I mean, this is our job. This cycles what pays our paycheck. We use HTTP. We start with the request, and then something happens, and that's our job, and we return a response. So as at least we can agree on this level. So traditionally, uh, PHP mangles our request in the following way. Uh, if you don't recognize the thing on top there, that is a raw HTTP request message. So this is what the message looks like as it's floating across the tubes towards our server. And it gets into our server, and PHP takes that information in and makes it available to us. But it makes it available to us in a very strange way. Uh, a lot of the information is available via these server superglobals. We just have to kind of go out and find the information uh, from there. You'll notice that this has a host header, an accept header, and a user agent header. So part of the fun is that PHP capitalizes them and adds HTTP underscore, um, just so we don't find them at first. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like a fail safe, so we read the documentation a little bit. <clears throat> so the Symphony's request object is very simple. It's 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 uh, it's it's beautiful because it's not overwhelming. It's just an object-oriented wrapper around that. And, we, and if you're using the Symfony framework, or well, if you're using anything with the Symfony components, you're going to use this all the time. And you notice it's just like, in this case, request arrow headers arrow get, and we actually put the header accept. Because you know what? That's actually what the header is called. 
um, that came to our server. And if you do, you know, inspect the element and do the network thing and actually look at the request comes in, you'll see the list of request headers come into your server. You're just going to get them off by their real name. So the request object takes in this, the, uh, uh, the, all the PHP super globals and actually cleans them up and makes them look like an object-oriented version of the original message instead of kind of this mangled thing. And of course, we're not using super globals anymore. Um, so you know, that, that has a whole host of uh, advantages as well. So same thing with the response. Um, the response is, that, that's actually what an HTTP response looks like on top. So that's actually what our job is, is to create that. We create it in a very indirect way. Um, the response is always the same thing, which is that special first line that basically says the status code, header, 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 blank line, content. Okay, It's always in that format. We create it by calling the header function. And then even the set cookie is actually just a function that makes a header. Uh, and then we just start barfing out content. And as soon as we start barfing out content, uh, basically PHP knows to add that blank line for us. And this is actually what gets sent back to the, uh, to the end client. Um, so there's a Symphony response object, which just makes this a little bit nicer and a little bit simpler. And obviously, there's some disadvantages to just echoing content or setting headers in your application. Uh, if you do that and you set a header up here, but you need to all of a sudden di- decide down here you need, to, you need to unset that header, you can't do that. So by preparing a response object that flows through your application, you have an opportunity to do more things with it. This is the same thing in Symphony 1. The Symphony 2 response object is cleaner, but it's the same thing in Symphony 1. So now we can create a mini framework with just these two pieces. And these, the, the HTTP foundation is my favorite part because it's like if you don't do anything else, for God's sakes, use HTTP foundation in whatever you're building. So this is maybe what a little framework looks like before. Um, there's all kinds of problems with this. The request URI is going to have like question mark query parameters on the end of it if those in the URL, so it's not good to compare those. Um, but here we go. This is a framework. And we can create this up or clean this up quite a bit. Um, it's something I'm working on with Fabian right here. <coughs> We can clean this up quite a bit just by using the request and the response. And the git path info is actually what internally gets mapped to the routing, and it's basically the URL cleaned up without the query parameter stuff on it, which is actually kind of, kind of hard to do. There's a path info server variable that's available um, sometimes. All right, so that's that. I'm going to leave that be. Um, all, this is documented well, so I invite you to stop listening to me and check out the documentation. There's some really cool stuff. The session handling in HTTP Foundation is ridiculous. It's new, new ridiculousness for 2.1. Um, so check that out. Next, HTTP kernel. And this is a weirdo. All right. The HTTP kernel is the, um, it's like the most important thing ever, basically. But it's not going to make sense at first. So bear with me. So we know we have requests. We know we have a response. And we know that in between, we're going to do this like MVC thing, or at least what we call MVC, because it's, you know, the frameworks aren't usually exactly MVC. And what that means is somewhere between the request and the response, whatever you're using is somehow going to determine a controller and then render that controller. And by controller, I mean a PHP function. So it's a very simple pattern. Like at the, the, the lowest level, it's like, OK, we're going to look at the request information. And f- from that, we're going to decide to call some PHP function. We're going to execute that PHP function. It's going to build the page however it wants to. So this is like the basic thing we can kind of agree on in, uh, in most kind of frameworks. So frameworks just that pattern of uh, converting a request to a response. And this is exactly what HTTP kernel does. This is fundamentally important because this is what's going to be used in um, uh, uh, Drupal, Symfony 2, and anything else that adopts this. And really, pretty much every application should adopt this. Because uh, when you kind of get under the hood, you'll, you'll see what I mean. It's very not opinionated. It's just a great framework to build an application around. And this is what it looks like. This doesn't tell you much, but this is what Symfony 2 looks like. This is, correct me if I'm wrong, pretty much exactly what Drupal is going to look like on some level. You're going to find, okay, you're going to find these lines. I mean, this is your framework executing. You create a request, you put it into this handle function, it gives you a response out. So before we're not, we're going to look a little bit at what handle actually does because now if you're looking at this, we're like, what the hell is he talking about? The important thing here is that this defines that your application is no longer just some big weird page that reads super globals and then does something. It's actually a function function whose input is request and output is response. Because you can imagine in a PHP script now, I could actually call handle five different times and just pass it a different request object every time. I can make a request object that looks like the home page. It'll give me back a response that looks like the home page. Do it for some other page, it'll give me back a different response. So this defines kind of this, uh, our, our application being a function, not just some big global thing where we just echo content all over the place. 
Oh, yeah, and if you want to see those, those lines are in app.php or app underscore dev.php. I mean, that's what boots, boots Symphony. So, yeah, I know it's confusing, and we'll talk about it more. Uh, Event Dispatcher, this was in Symphony 1 as well. Probably most of you have heard about it. Hopefully, most of you are feeling very good about Event Dispatching. Um, if not, I had Leanna make us a really nice animation here. So, we're going to talk about Event Dispatching really briefly. Uh, event Dispatcher component is effectively a single class. There's more classes, but effectively a single class, which is called the Event Dispatcher. And it works by different parts of our application called listeners. Just being like, yo, what's up, man? Let me know when this happens. And the event, event Dispatcher is like, OK. Then things happen in our application. So somebody comes along, and they basically say, hey, this is happening. Okay? And that goes to the Event Dispatcher. Event Dispatcher tells all of our listeners that that's happening. And then the listeners just do something. So this is uh, similar to jQuery and similar to other things. And hopefully this is not like, oh my god, I've never heard that before. Hopefully you're starting to feel kind of comfortable with this or you're already, this is old news for you. This is important because this is um, inside that, that cryptic kernel handle function. It's all event driven. It's all event driven. Um, so this is very, very important if you're, as you get more advanced with your framework. And typically, as people get more advanced, they start to take advantage of more of the symphony events that happen inside that function. So anyways, we'll come, uh, we'll, we'll, well, we'll see part of that again. But I'm going to keep breezing past that. Uh, the last part is routing. Uh, and it, we all definitely understand what I mean by routing. It's like, yeah, I have a YAML file and I have some routes in them. And then when the application executes, it matches them. And then something else happens. So that's correct. But looking at the routing, at, um, if we actually look at the routing at a low level, we might learn a little bit more about what's actually happening when the Symphony framework executes. <clears throat> so this is uh, what it would look like, or one possible way it would look like, if you were using the routing component directly. And I've actually done this before. It's very simple. Obviously, we all understand it. Like, I'm going to have a router. Bam, router. I'm going to load it with routes. Bam, I'm loading it with a slash blog slash curly blaze slug route. And then I'm going to call match on it. I'm going to pass it the URL. And of course, it's going to what? Like match the route and tell me which route got matched. So, the, so the, this is all uh, hopefully like, yeah, OK, that's, that's how I thought it would work. The only interesting part is, what is the return value here? What is results? Is it the route name, like blog? Or is it like, what does it actually return from that? The answer is it returns just this random array of information about the route. One thing is the route name, on underscore route. And it also fills in the slug wildcard. So the input for router is effectively a URL, or a URL plus some other request information. And the output is always an array that sort of describes that route that was matched. This is important, because this should actually look very familiar. Notice it's the exact same thing, except up there I've added a second argument to the new route, which is an array, which has underscore controller and then some crap after it. So that second argument, you may recognize it if you use the Symfony framework, is the defaults key. So when you have a route, you have pattern, and then you have defaults under it. This is interesting because when we match this, the def whatever's in that defaults array makes it into our array that comes back. So the input is that the URL. The output is this array of information. So now, if you hopefully you guys are kind of thinking about what's actually happening under the hood inside Symphony Framework, we give it the underscore controller key in our route. And when the route matches, the route gives Symphony back that underscore controller key. And guess what it does with that? It executes it. I mean, that's the key. That's the key uh, for, for taking, that's the, the key thing that matches some random URL ultimately to some PHP function in your code that gets executed. And there's nothing special about it. It's just like, hey, let's, you know, Fabian was sitting in his basement probably one day and he's like, I don't know, let's make an underscore controller key and we'll give it back and then we'll just execute it. <clears throat> so this is, uh, this in particular is just the opinionated way that the Symphony framework decides to determine the controller. Drupal will do something different. So when you put this all together, you get the framework which I'm not going to show you, unfortunately, too much of the internals. Uh, but inside kernel handle, it uses the HTTP foundation libraries, uses the event dispatcher, and it just starts throwing all these events. Um, it probably uses the routing to figure out which controller to do. Um, and, and that's basically our framework. And our framework is always like request, routing, routing to controller, controller to response. So. The homework here, because I have, like, I'm, I'm, this is actually one of my favorite things to show people when I'm doing a training. It's like we just dive into the code and just start var dumping the corpse symphony and, like, light bulbs go off and people high five me even though I didn't write the code. <clears throat> so, unfortunately, I don't have time to do that now, um, but I want you guys to do that. So, if, this should all sound a little bit abstract because I, I just cannot go into this right now without you guys booing me off the stage. 
This is kernel, uh, HTTP kernel, colon, colon, handle raw. This is the uh, heart of the Symfony framework. And I invite you to var dump die the heck out of this right now. And this, uh, this code is actually really, really cool. And I'll even give you a couple uh, hints here on things to look for. And that's the class you're looking for. So pop that open. You have PHP Storm. Go ahead and pop open that class. Uh, or you can check my slides later. <clears throat> and for the Symfony framework, um, there's two classes in particular that are going to uh, kind of complete the picture of what happens internally. One is the router listener. And so um, this is the one piece that actually executes the Symfony routing layer. And the other part is the controller resolver class. And this is the part that actually goes and looks for the underscore controller key, changes it from our you know, bundle colon controller colon action into a fully qualified namespace, instantiates our new controller object, and returns that to, to, the, to the framework. Um, so events are very, very key here. And uh, one of the really nice things with the web debug toolbar, or specifically the profiler when you click into it, is that you can see exactly which ones are running um, on every single request. So this is the timeline that's new to Symfony 2.1. So if you haven't used Symfony 2.1 yet, you haven't seen this. This is the timeline. And above this, you can't see it. There's a little thing that says threshold. And it kind of says, only show me things that are like over one millisecond. If you, t- uh, if you take that down to zero, because some of these are really fast, you'll see everything that happened. And you'll see all the different... Um, events that were thrown by Symfony, and all the different listeners, which are like little elves making your framework work, all those little listeners that are, uh, are doing things behind the scenes. There's also another spot, which is you just click events, and it's the same thing. It won't show you how long they took, but it'll show you exactly which uh, events happened and who's listening on them. So really, really powerful stuff. Okay, cool. Awesome. So everything else is basically awesome tools. Uh, all we really need is um, this route controller pattern. Um, that's all we really need to survive. And if we were just building a Hello World application, that's all we'd need. We'd just return Hello World from our controller and we'd be done with it. Of course, that's not the reality. So there's going to be other tools that we need. Like, for example, the form uh, component is a tool that we need very commonly. So all the other components are tools. And we're just going to run through some of the more interesting ones. So first, process. How many people have used the process component? Eh, no? OK, yeah, not bad. Five, yeah. Yeah. One from Nashville. Nice. OK, so the process component is really cool. So we're going to go ahead and get it from Composer, install it, and bam, we have it available. And again, you can just do this from a flat PHP file right now. And here's the, here's the test case here. So the process uh, helps you run other processes. So imagine you needed to call like ls-la from a PHP script somewhere. The process helps you do that. So this is my external process here. Yes, it's a PHP script, but you can imagine this would be a Java app or anything. And this is going to cook dinner for us. It's going to take exactly three seconds. It's going to update us every second. So it's going to be like bam, 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 done. Okay, So that's how it's going to work. So it's going to take three seconds to run. So that's just a good test case. Process lets us do a couple interesting things. First, it allows us to run that synchronously, which is uh, pretty straightforward. Create a new process uh, class or object. Tell it what process we're going to run. You can set some timeout stuff there. Um, and then you call run. And it'll run it. That callback there is going to be called every time our external application sends anything to standard out or standard error. So it's going to be like, it'll be hit like, in our case, it'll be hit like once a second as it's kind of looping through that, uh, that script. Then, of course, once it's finished, and this is synchronous, remember, so this is actually going to kind of like wait until this is finished running. It's going to go down here, and you can do whatever you want with the output or do any tests on it or anything else you want. Cool? So synchronous, that's cool. I mean, that's kind of nice. And that's how it looks. You can see it's coming out like piece by piece by piece. We can also run scripts asynchronously, which is, um, in some cases, more interesting. In this case, it's the exact same thing, except in, uh, previously we did run. This time, we're just going to call start. So we call start up there, and then our code immediately goes down below it, and we can do more work in our code. And then if we want to wait for the process to finish running, we can just go, for example, on a while loop and just ask. Ask it be like, while the process is running, just keep looping through. And then at the bottom, the process is finally done. So it's a really great way to run something asynchronously, but still kind of keep track of it and be able to ask questions on it. Is it done yet? Did it exit? Was there an error when it exited? Was there output? Instead of just kind of like running it and letting it go or running it synchronously. You can also interact uh, via standard in. So you can imagine our external script actually asks us a question that we need to answer. So we can set the standard in, and this will communicate with that external thing. So in this case, uh, we run our, uh, our app, and it asks us what we want to eat. Our standard in feeds that external thing, turkey, and it, uh, it, it prints it out. 
It's all kinds of just low-level stuff that we don't normally want to worry about. There's a, some PHP functions that handle this stuff, and, and the process is basically a wrapper around them. Except the PHP functions are kind of a bummer. I've never really used them. But process is really easy to use. So of course, you can handle things that blow up as well. So in this case, that callback for function, it actually has a uh, type argument, or the first argument, whatever you want to call it. And that's e either going to be out or error. Uh, based on standard out or standard error. So if whatever you're calling communicates through standard error, um, you can grab that here, and, and you'll know if there's an error being thrown. Of course, you can check if the whole process itself is successful. Cool. That was easy. There's docs on that. That's a nice one to use. I could bring that into any application. So let's keep going. Oh, actually, this one. How many people have heard of Spork? Oh, kind of bad. Uh, Spork's is a fun one. I threw it in here because it's very similar. It's made by our friend Chris Wallsmith. Um, and it helps you... Um, run PHP and uh, uh, sub-processes. So you can see here, it's kind of like a fun little interface. So if you do stuff like this, go ahead and check Spork out. It's not a Symfony component, but it's just one of those little libraries that you can just bring in via Composer and play with. I mean, that stuff's really easy now. So Finder. How many people have used Finder before? That's what I expect. A little bit more. Finder was in Symfony 1 um, as well. Finder is really, really awesome whenever you need it. So some of you guys have, may have uh, seen this before. So this was written by Fabian about a year and a half ago. Uh, in this case, he's basically just having fun with Finder. So Finder's job is just to filter down via a whole list of files and find stuff. So if you need to scan a directory for JPEG files that were modified less than an hour ago, then this is Finder's what you use to do that. In this case, just to add insult to awesomeness, um, we're also using a stream wrapper, so we're actually doing this on S3, which is just kind of cool. I mean, Finder at that point doesn't care. It thinks it's a file system. So that's Finder. And Finder has other things that you can filter on. It's very, very cool and very, very easy. And it, it solves that very small problem that you have, which before may not have been worth bringing in a whole component, but now it's really easy to do so. Next one, Symfony File System, new in 2.1. Uh, we can bring it in very easily. Nothing uh, new there. And it's basically a wrapper around doing file system operations. Again, very small problem, but it solves it very, very well. In this case, I'm abusing the fact on the previous example that I have an S3 stream wrapper. So in this case, I'm actually copying from a local cowboy.jpg, and I'm copying that up to S3. I'm copying from S3 down local. Um, and mirror is actually something that you point to a directory and say, hey, go to that directory, copy that entire directory over here. Uh, in this case, we're actually doing it from a local thumbnails directory up to S3. And you guys can do this. I actually did, this is actually real code. Um, the stream wrapper barfs on some things. Obviously, I can't chmod over an S3 stream. You know, your computer sort of starts smoking. Um, but you can do a lot of the basic stuff. And all this stuff works on the file system. You can also combine things. So here's Finder and file system together. So we use Finder to filter down on the exact files we need in these directories. And I pass that to file systems, uh, chmod function. It's just going to chmod all those things for us. Okay? And there's all kinds of other things, symlink, and all kinds of other things you, need, you can do with this. Which, it's documented, so you guys can go there. The Symphony components, as of like October last year, the last Symphony conference I went to, were not documented at all. Most of them are documented now. You guys can go find these things um, and just start using them. Just take advantage of them. Especially if you're in the framework. A lot of cases, um, you know, there's already a service for a lot of these things. You can just use it. And if there's not a service, you can create it. perfect example is the serializer that Hugo talked about yesterday. That's not a service in the Symphony framework. You just create the, the service yourself and register it. Console, how many people have used the console as a standalone application? It's not bad. Everybody's used the console, probably, or everybody that's at least on the Symphony framework. Uh, Composer uses uh, the console uh, uh, component, which is why it looks and feels so familiar to us. So anytime you need uh, just some flat PHP script that does something, I mean, this is basically, don't make flat PHP scripts anymore for little cron jobs. Just stick them into a command thing. Um, so in this case, you can run php command.php. It spits out the familiar menu, and I can run a command on the bottom. The actual command.php script, which I hit before, is just about eight lines long. It just creates a new instance of application, uh, creates a new instance of any of our commands, any of our custom commands, um, and then calls app run. It's almost like a micro framework. And then, of course, there's what the commands look like. This is too easy to use to continue making flat PHP scripts. This will handle your uh, biggest reason to use it are handles your input arguments. So now from your cron job, you can be like, hey, I'm running this. Space, argument, space, argument. You don't have to try to get those from argv. Uh, you can also pass options. And most importantly, you can send it colored output very easily. OK? That's why I use it. And you can learn more about command. There's all kinds of cool things you can do with it beyond what I'm showing you here. 
Um, but wait, if you download Composer in the next five minutes, we'll even throw in CSS Selector and DOM Crawler, one of the older Symphony 2 components. Again, very easy. It's just a jQuery-like object. So we give it HTML, and bam, we can just call filter. And obviously, we could put a, you know, this could be p dot something or whatever. Just run CSS on it and get information. What's the uh, attribute? What's the href? What's the text inside this node? Very simple. It, it, it fits a very small problem, but it fits it very, very well. Uh, if you've heard of the Goot library, it's just like a little web scraper crawler uh, made by Fabian. It's built off of two, these two components and uh, one other component and a piece of Guzzle. Yeah, Guzzle, thank you. <coughs> config, this is another one. Uh, we talked about this yesterday. So if you guys, I mean, every application has uh, configuration. And typically, if you have an older application, it's like this giant uh, PHP array file and you're like, doing if statements for different environments. Um, you don't need to do that. This is going to allow you to load configuration from YAML files, XML files, whatever you want, merge them together. These are the things that Dennis talked about yesterday. Merge them together, do validation, be like, oh my god, in our production environment, I forgot the database name. It'll tell you that kind of stuff. Um, and it's going to cache it. So I mean, I think that's one of the reasons in a, in a more legacy application, the first reason why you keep configuration in PHP is because you're like, oh, I can bring the YAML component, but then I have to worry about caching it. Well, this is going to take care of that as well. Um, and uh, there's documentation on this. So go check out the documentation. Uh, validator, same way. Somebody asked yesterday um, about using the validator inside the, um, the configuration tree when Dennis was talking. You can absolutely do that. You just need to create your validation um, object uh, and make use of it in there. And you can do this from, from anywhere. And, and actually, Hugo, you did uh, a thing on command back in um, Germany last year, and I think you showed the validator being used inside of a command script. So same thing. So he was, he was grabbing input. That's another one of those things that the command component does really well. He's grabbing input, and he was actually using the validator to validate you know, that I gave it an email address from the command line. So there's a little bit of setup here, um, which could be more complicated if you're doing more complicated things. But it's pretty simple. I have my raw value. I create an email constraint. Um, I configure it, email arrow message, just a public function on it. Then I call validator validate value, pass it the value, pass it what I want it to validate against. And it's going to give me back an array of errors. And either those errors are going to be empty, or they're going to have one, two, or three. In this case, just one um, element in it. And um, the actual errors object of these things called, I can't remember, message templates, I think. And they just have like a, the information about the, the error on them. OK, so that's simple enough. So that's nice. Uh, the big thing here is that there's 34 built-in validators on counting because it's easy for us to do an if statement, right? If I have it, need a little bit of validation, there's tons of validators built in for email, reg expressions, IP addresses. Um, so take advantage of these. Um, and even uh, that's, that's my thing. I just merged the documentation the other day for that. Um, the brand new Loon validator, which I should say, I should have put a caveat there. That would be brand new in Symphony 2.2, um, though you could always just go into the code base and steal that back and backport it. Um, there's nothing special about it for 2.2 for validating the credit card numbers. It's an algorithm for seeing if it's, uh, the credit card numbers are at least somewhat legitimate. Cool. But well, wait, there's more, which we're not going to talk about because we're out of time. Um, there's tons more components. You guys can look into the option resolvers, new in 2.1. The form component uses that. That's a nice little convenient thing. Um, so you can dive into these. Most of these components are very, very easy to use. They have loaded little dependencies. They have very little setup. Um, not all of them are so easy. <coughs> Thanks for laughing. That would have been awkward. <laughs> um, the first key is documentation. Obviously, um, a lot of these are hard because if they're not documented, we have to kind of figure out. So the documentation is getting better and better and better. Pretty much all the easy ones are covered. Um, you know, we, we're, we can work together as a community to make them you know, more friendly and things like that. But a lot of these are documented very well, um, so you can find, find details on them. And even the harder ones, as soon as we kind of uh, uh, write the documentation for them, um, then they're not so hard anymore. And so there's actually a work in progress right now um, by a community member on the Symphony docs to document the security component. So he just went straight to the hardest thing. Um, it's a work in progress right now, but when that's finished, it will actually be an interesting read. You don't want to read what's really going on with the security, security component. Um, you can read that. And that's going to probably teach you a lot about what's going on in the Symphony framework's use of it behind the scenes. So we have this brand new world where we're able to easily bring in external libraries. It's no longer a bummer. So how do we kick ass in it? Uh, the first thing is realize that Symphony is only one piece of the picture. Uh, of course, I think it's the best. Of course, I'd, but uh, it's only one piece of the picture. Um, and other things exist. So how do we find good libraries? Um, you guys probably have even more ways. So you guys can shout things out. Um, the two ways I find them are now that we have Composer, let's go to packages and actually look for stuff. So in this case, you can say I'm searching for menu. 
And the top one is actually a Symphony 2 bundle, but if you look below it, uh, KMP Menu is just like a standalone PHP 5.3 library for helping out with menu stuff. Cool, maybe I didn't know about that. So now I know about it, I can bring it into my project. The other one is, and this I've been doing even longer, is GitHub. GitHub, filter down by the PHP language, enter in what you're looking for, and hopefully you find something, look for whatever has the most uh, forks and stars. Unfortunately, you can't sort by stars, as far as I know. Um, in this case, we're searching for logging, and lo and behold, we have monologue coming up third. Uh, and if you look at the two above these, they actually have like no watchers and no forks. And all of a sudden, bam, you have monologue here with 621 stars and 110 forks. So bam, you go, I found my, found my logger. And you'll be surprised by the, the kind of things that you're going to find out there. So a couple of favorites of mine, because so I had a few minutes to do this. Um, first one is Mink. How many people have used Mink? Not bad. How many people have used Behat? How many people have used Behat but not Mink? Okay, good job. They're like, they're like, they go hand in hand, so probably if you, most people have used Behat, you also use Mink. I didn't catch anybody. Um, so Behat's a behavioral-driven development library. It's very, very nice. It partners with this library called Mink, and most people don't even realize that Mink is its own standalone, standalone library that does amazing things. So that's why I wanted to bring it up. It's just a little thing that allows you to command a browser. So in this case, I can have this session variable. I tell it to visit a page. Once I get to the page, I find some stuff via CSS. I call click, and bam, all of a sudden I go page to get content, and that's the content on the next page. I could keep going from here and be like, find this form element. You know, click it or, or, or check this box, fill in this text, hit this submit form. Bam, all of a sudden I'm on the next page. So if you imagine uh, creating a, an object that acts like a browser and acts like, kind of like a jQuery object, um, this is what Mink does. And what makes Mink special is that first line, that driver line, uh, Mink is made to run. Obviously, we need a browser to run these. This is going to happen in a real browser. So this could happen in a headless browser like Goot. Like it's all happening kind of behind the scenes. Um, it could also happen in a real browser like Selenium, popping up a real browser, or like Zombie.js, uh, which is a, a headless browser that supports JavaScript. So just by changing that first line, I could have the same PHP code um, and actually execute it in a headless browser or have it pop open in, in um, Selenium. So in my projects, I actually do this in conjunction with Behat. Half of my tests run in headless browsers because it's faster. And then, bam, I'm all of a sudden running a test. I'm like, oh, this test needs JavaScript. Bing. And all of a sudden, I'm running that same code, except it's popping open the browser in JavaScript, or and popping up the browser so I have JavaScript, uh, and it runs this um, in, in JavaScript land so I can do that test. So anyways, look that up. Uh, interesting library. Next one, your friend Jordy, Monologue. Most people actually know about this, but I think this is a really great library because uh, mon uh, logging is not necessarily very interesting. Uh, it's kind of like auto-loading. It just needs to work. And you know, darn it, I want it to work with lots of bells and whistles. For those of you that use the Symphony framework, you can, with about three lines of code in your config underscore prod.yaml file, have critical errors emailed to you. It's three lines in the YAML file. That's it. Well, it's probably like five lines. No code at all. Because Monolog comes with all these bells and whistles. Like, you just don't want to worry about this stuff. And by the way, if, you are, if that kind of piqued your interest, just go to the Symphony's documentation, go to the cookbook, and there's actually a cookbook entry about like, emailing yourself errors from Monolog. In this, in this example, we're actually also logging to Fire PHP if that's your thing. There's also Zen Framework 2. <clears throat> they have some stuff. Um, and you can just go and find more. So, four reasons to get excited about the future and, and, and run down the street and high five each other and high five my wife. First, look for participation and consolidation. Uh, this will happen initially on the lowest component, which is great. Uh, these components are going to be using uh, parts of the Symphony component library in one way or another. Uh, this is cool for two reasons. One, as we learned yesterday from Larry, th this is actually going to put things upstream to make those libraries better. Um, and two, it means that I can actually walk into Drupal now, kind of know what's going on. I don't know anything about Drupal right now. It scares me. But all of a sudden, there's going to be a kernel there. I know how the kernel works. That's kind of ridiculous, right? Who here ever thought that they would accidentally know the core of Drupal without ever opening a line of Drupal code? Or, or want to know the core of Drupal. No offense, I mean, it's just the core part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, hey, maybe even less library duplication. This is a really hard problem to solve. Um, and this is not knocking anybody. Uh, by the way, that, that's not my job. But these people are all way smarter than I am. I'm just saying this is a little bit uh, ridiculous. And, and I could put five other frameworks further to the right of this with uh, components that work exactly the same. If you look at my GitHub, you'll see I have, I have something called PHP Christmas Miracle, which is where I took HTTP Foundation, uh, la, 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 uh, the Lithium Router, and something from Zen Framework and made a frame, uh, framework out of it. 
which is sort of absurd because they all do the exact same things. You should not be able to mix components on that low of a level and have it make sense. Second, um, expect more high-quality community libraries to be out there. The reason is, five years ago, to be in the game, you had to write a framework. And then people use your framework or they didn't use your framework. If I wrote three years ago, I mean, I wrote a couple things that I thought were pretty good. If I wrote like little standalone PHP libraries, no one would use them because it was hard for them to bring them into their project. Probably I'd even need to worry about having an autoloader and they'd need to worry about you know, hooking up my autoloader. So this is not the case anymore. Uh, you, everyone can solve, and you guys, the community, we can solve very, very micro problems. And as long as we've solved it well and we've solved the real problem and we put it on, on Packagist, then people are going to bring them in. So the, the amount of libraries is just going to explode. I mean, imagine if the, you know, hopefully a year, two, three years in the future, if the Drupal module guys get a hold of this. I mean, there's just boatloads of wonderful like, uh, problems that are being solved. I've, I've stolen part of it before. And imagine if those make their way upstream, and all of a sudden we have these little libraries that are standalone PHP things for us to take advantage of. So find them, uh, fork them, and write their documentation. This is one of the things, right? It's like, well, I found a library, but I don't know. It wasn't, I like, tried one thing, and it kind of like, didn't work, sort of. It um, didn't have a lot of documentation. It's like, well, you know, write the docs. We, we do not need more libraries. Um, we need fewer high-quality libraries. Um, I do not want to go to GitHub next time and see two loggers, neither of which have documentation. I want to see a single logger that you've used in your project and added documentation. I mean, you've just basically saved my butt and saved the butt of the rest of us by focusing in on that. Uh, three, easier upgrades. Um, I kind of threw this one at the last second. A lot of you guys are still on Symphony 1 projects, and you know, the question is, well, how do I upgrade to Symphony 2? There's a couple answers to that. One is, uh, depending on it, you probably don't if you have... Um, Lots of, uh, if it's something where you work on it only a little bit, um, or even you work on it not that much, and maybe it's not a long term thing, like don't upgrade it. I mean, that's just, a, upgrade is just a ton of effort um, and, and really cannot afford a rewrite. Uh, if your business is centered around a single product, however, and you foresee that product being something that you guys work on for the next three, five, seven years, then this is something where actually you legitimately do need to ask, well, how do I actually upgrade this to Symphony 2? Well, with the components, you don't necessarily need to. Um, where is Danny? Ah, there he is. Hey, wait, wait, wait. Yay! Okay. <clears throat> uh, if you are in this situation, Danny has done a very interesting thing, a thing that I thought would be a good idea in theory, but like he's actually doing it in his project. He has a Symphony 1 project, and he's just piece by piece gutting it and replacing it with Symphony 2 components. He has the container in his project. He has, he's working on like the form thing next. All kinds of things to make his life easier. And when you bring in Symphony 2 components into a Symphony 1 project, it also changes your way about how you develop. And instead of having you know, 40 lines of code in your controller, all of a sudden you start making services. And when you take those 40 lines out of your controller and put it into a service, regardless of what framework you're using, what you end up with is 40 lines of code that is now framework independent. It, that's almost its own little mini component. And so little by little, you can actually gut your Symphony 1 application, put Symphony 2 stuff into it, and take your code and unbind it from Symphony 1. And ultimately, that means that you, upgrading would be easier, or you may even get to a spot where you're like, hey, man, like, life is OK. I have three quarters of Symphony 2 and Symphony 1, and I'm not really using the Symphony 1 pieces anymore. I effectively have Symphony 2 with a different directory structure, and, and you, you have all the, uh, um, all the good parts of it without any of the pain of actually doing the rewrite or anything else. So that's your guy back there. Uh, you can tackle him on the way out. And, uh, and he'll answer all your questions. I didn't tell him I was going to do that. <clears throat> Finally, grow your community. So solutions are going to exist outside of our framework. We can't just expect our framework to solve everything for us. You can't expect Fabian to knock on your door and be like, hey, man, there's a new logger out there. I want you to know about it. It's not going to happen anymore. We have to go out there and find those things for ourselves. Obviously, Symphony is going to take good care of us, and, and having the contacts we're making during this conference means that Hugo is going to tell me about that new library. Um, that's all good, but we are responsible for doing that. You're also casting your vote. Uh, to go back to the example of, do I rewrite this library? Do I you know, use it and write its documentation? We're voting for the best libraries every time we use them. So are we going to continue to allow us to have 50 solutions for the same thing? Or are we going to consolidate? Are we going to be okay with being like, you know what, that's the best library, even though it's written by a historically Zen framework guy? Who cares? If that's the better library, let's use it. And hopefully they'll do the same thing a little bit for our libraries, and we'll have less libraries and higher quality things. I mean, this is exactly uh, what Drupal's doing. If we take Drupal out of the picture, our libraries are less good. We don't have the flashbag in Symphony 2.1. 
if um, oh, I can't remember. There's, there's a, a, a blank in the name. There's another library uh, which uh, Drac is in charge of. Who's what's the library? Zakula. Yeah, Zakula. If Zakula wasn't using Symfony components, then we wouldn't have badass session handling in 2.1. This is going to happen across the board. So vote by using the best libraries, and we can hopefully get rid of the crappy libraries. And ultimately, the goal here is to realize the power of the entire PHP community. If you guys leverage everything, if you're taking information from everybody, you're going to kick ass. We're way bigger than everybody else, and we can do some amazing things. And the things that the PHP community has done in the past year or two are incredibly exciting, and we have a lot of momentum, and we can just run with it now. All right, and that's it. Thank you very much.